So thank you. I first just want to start by thanking Clint and Andrew for inviting uh, me to give this presentation together with the, our co-authors on the paper where we assess the phylogenomic systematics of the spotted skunks. But given this group, I, I think the better title for this talk would be this. Um, so there's really seven species of spotted skunks instead of four. Now what? So <clears throat> I, I think following along those lines, the idea that, that who cares besides those of us in this group, the number of species of spotted skunks that are out there, and I think first and foremost, we, we cannot conserve what we do not know. Um, so we must know the species out there in order to conserve and protect them and understand their evolution. Uh, species are treated as the fundamental unit for conservation, ecology, and evolution. And they're often taken for granted. Uh, idea that in this case in hand, the perpetuation of species by chance, for example, why four species of spilagale, as indicated here in this figure from the Handbook of Mammals of the World 2009, which shows the four extant species. Uh, for Spilagale in particular, there's implications for understanding much broader phenomena, including the evolution of delayed implantation, uh, origins and loss of carnivore diversity, and quantification of variation in aposomatic signals, just to name a few. And then what I hope to talk a little bit about today is that, you know, once we delimit these new species or, or you know, quote, new species, elevated subspecies in this case, um, it creates the need for additional studies. The idea that, you know, what one species does can't be transferred to another uh, in terms of ecology, conservation and management. So it's no surprise to this group, but, you know, part of the relevance of our study is the idea that the subspecies Putorius and Eruptor, the plain spotted skunk, is being considered as listed as endangered under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, due to a number of uh, strong significant declines as documented by uh, Dr. Gomper and his colleagues. So when it comes to taxonomic history of spotted skunks, revisions of spotted skunks have, have occurred since as early as 1838, kind of culminating in Ben Gelder's tome of... Uh, uh, the Spotted Skunk A&H Bulletin in 1959. But the consensus as to how many species are in this group has varied from that time, ranging from as few as two to as many as 14 species in Howell's 1906 uh, monograph on the revision of the group. But as you can see, starting about 2005, uh, through the most recent treaties in 2017, it's honed in on approximately four species of extant spotted skunks uh, in ex uh, existence today. Uh, these are the four species that uh, have kind of become the consensus among the mammal community. That's the western spotted skunk, Spilagale gracilis, the eastern spotted skunk, Spilagale pitorius, the southern spotted skunk, Spilagale angustifrons, and the pygmy spotted skunk, Spilagale pygmaea. So most of these early taxonomic uh, histories and assessments and revisions were based on morphology, either uh, color patterns or cranial dental morphology, as well as bacular and, and a few karyotypes. But what about molecular studies in the group? Uh, early studies uh, led by Dragu and colleagues were really focused on defining Mephididae as a distinct family, as well as understanding the generic relationships between the three uh, North American and Old World uh, genera of skunks. Uh, more recently, uh, investigations into um, intraspecific variations, such as subspecies patterns or phylogeographic history, uh, and then a more broadly uh, sweeping one of microsatellites looking at the Cutorius interrupta question in particular. But to date, a, a thorough systematic assessment or phylogenetic assessment of the, the four extant species at large across the range has not been uh, done, which was the major objective of our study. And we were particularly interested in the phylogenetic affinity or genetic distinctness of the southern spotted skunk, Spilagale and Gustafrons. Which, uh, whose species status was based solely on karyotype data from the 1990s and from specimens in El Salvador. So uh, no, no uh, reason to hide the reason I got into skunks is working with Bob Dowler. Uh, and actually, I think the intensive accumulation of the spotted skunk samples began about 2006 when Himaguera, shown here in this picture from our trip to Mexico, started her master's on genetics of Western spotted skunks. Um, Catching spotted skunks or building uh, samples for them is not like catching paramiscus. So uh, we made many trips to Mexico as the one indicated there, but unsuccessfully trapped spotted skunks. We used a, a number of novel approaches, including wanted posters to try to solicit specimens from trappers and roadkill. Uh, and then finally turning to museum specimens for some of the other spe uh, species that we just could not get modern samples for, such as the Southern spotted skunk. Uh, we decided to focus on uh, complete mitochondrial genomes and for the mitochondrial data and then ultra conserved elements or UCEs for the nuclear data using next generation sequencing approaches and uh, mybates. 
So this is a map depict, depicting, excuse me, the 203 samples, uh, indicating the modern samples in the red circles and the historic samples in the blue triangle. And as I mentioned before, despite several attempts, both to collect in Guatemala and, and other parts across Mexico, uh, we did not obtain any modern samples from Spilagel and Gustafrons, um, with the exception of those from Oaxaca. So for phylogenetic methods, we used a kind of standard suite of methods. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm happy to answer questions about them um, or share the paper uh, to talk a little bit more detail. But just need to say we did maximum likelihood and Bayesian analysis for the metagenomes. Uh, we did both maximum likelihood and a species-based tree and astral for the ultra-conserved elements. And then we used cytochrome B data uh, because of its vast availability, both in GenBank and new samples to look at haplotype networks and kind of delimit species ranges. And then we also estimated divergence times in BEAST uh, using both metagenomes and UCE data. So the results for this study, we ended up with metagenomes for 52 individuals composed of 17 historic and 35 modern samples. Uh, this represented more than 16,000 base pairs for those individuals. Now for UCEs, which is a little harder to get for the nuclear data, especially from the historical specimens, uh, we ended up with 36 individuals, four historic and 32 modern. Um, and just to give you an idea of kind of what those loci and UCEs represent in terms of overall base pair, uh, for the 50% missing data uh, set, it represents approximately 2 million base pairs of 4,000 loci. And the 30% missing data, 100,000 base pairs of approximately 3,500 loci. So it's a large amount of molecular data uh, to be able to try to answer these questions. And then we ended up with 203 individuals from 139 unique localities for the cytochrome B data. So I'm just going to go through some of the phylogenies here uh, to talk a little bit about what we recovered and the colors correspond to the taxonomic revision and we're using the names that we're proposing for these uh, evolutionary significant units or species um, here in the tree as well and the colors correspond to that. So the metagenome data indicated here by the Spazian phylogeny with nodal support indicated by the black circles uh, recovered uh, eight mitochondrial lineages that were phylogenetically distinct or monophyletic. Um, including four in what we're calling the Western lineages and uh, three in the Eastern lineage, and then the pygmy spotted skunk here. And of note is this uh, mitochondrial Sonoran clade uh, indicated by these individuals in Southern Arizona and Sonoran, Mexico. We'll talk a little bit about that um, because it showed up in the mitochondrial data, but not in the ultra conserved elements. So, History indicates the ultra-conserved element phylogeny, um, the cladogram based on 30, approximately 3,900 loci, the 60% matrix. And you can see that it recovers um, seven uh, unique nuclear lineages uh, with the exception of the loss of the Sonoran clade, although mitochondrially there are two individuals that nest within the leucoparia, the desert spotted skunk uh, nuclear genome as indicated here. And with a divergence dating using the mitochondrial 13 protein, excuse me, 13 protein coding genes of the mitochondria, uh, we recover again those eight lineages of uh, mitochondrial uh, evolution, including the Sonoran clade. Uh, but interestingly, I thought one of the most important patterns we uncovered was the coincidence of timing of diversification across the Eastern and Western lineages, beginning with an initial split of approximately 1.5 million years ago into those two major lineages. Then you saw coincident timing and diversification within those two lineages uh, to produce the diversity we see today. And we believe that was in response to uh, uh, retreating and expanding glacial, as well as uh, lengthening of interglacial periods between those glacial maxima, um, allowing expansion and, and uh, uh, dispersal of these populations through, uh, through across their current range. Uh, interestingly, our spread analysis, our spatial diffusion analysis, uh, actually really honed in on the, the hypothesis proposed by Van Gelder in 1959, uh, which very interestingly pointed to northern Mexico, the desert southwest, as kind of the origin of these two lineages migrating north in response to glacial uh, retreation, which is what we actually recovered with all the fancy molecular data we had. So pretty impressive that based on morphology of 1,500 or so museum specimens, Van Gelder was able to to develop this hypothesis that we were able to test. So we wanted to use the cytochrome B data in particular because we, you know, we only had the UCE for the one individual, Spilagel and Gustafrons. We wanted to see kind of where these haplotype uh, groups uh, fell out geographically to try to better demarcate the range of the species. 
And you can see again, we recover those, uh, we don't have the pygmea here, but the eight uh, uh, unique mitochondrial clusters or haplogroups here um, depicted in the, the range on the map as well. So when we very crudely demarcate those boundaries based on uh, purported phylogeographic bound barriers, as well as our distribution of these mitochondrial haplogroups, this is the distribution we came up with for the seven uh, species of spotted skunks or extant spotted skunks here. Uh, the type localities are indicated by the stars. Um, and then again, the range are demarcated there uh, very crudely in this, in this uh, map. So what did we conclude in terms of the taxonomic revision? Uh, we proposed that there are seven species of spotted skunks, starting with the pygmy spotted skunk, and then uh, three species each within the Eastern and Western lineage. Uh, we have the question mark there for angustifrons because we only had a single individual for the UCE, but it was statistically supported as a distinct um, lineage. And again, we relied solely on more uh, molecular data and not morphological data, which has been shown to be important for skunk evolution. And, and so obviously, hopefully incorporating those data you know, further would help uh, support or refute our hypothesis. I also just want to point out, it you know, led down somewhat of a rabbit hole, but a very interesting historical one regarding this very ambiguous type locality that's been perpetuated for centuries or a century of the upper Missouri River as the type for the plain spotted skunk. And together with Neil Woodman, a great naturalist and, and a, a real historian of Raffinesque, who was the authority that described the plain spotted skunk as a distinct species in 1820, uh, we were able to use original um, travel logs and information to actually redefine the type locality and confirm its type locality from Methodist or Spilagale Interrupta to Cheridan or Saline County, Missouri. And this is of significance because Raffinesque's travel in 1818, when he described this, this species, never ventured into the range of Spilagale putorius interrupta or Spilagale interrupta at that time. So he only spent time as indicated in the gray here and these dots of his travels in the range of Spilagale putorius. So had that we not been able to deduce that he actually got the specimen from Bradbury who collected it in, um, uh, in, in, sorry, in Missouri, then that would actually could have been the type for putorius and not interrupta. So again, highlighting this idea that, you know, okay, well now there's seven species, now what? Well, I think the first thing is, well, what do we know about those seven species? And this is a summary of published studies from 1990 to 2019 of Mafi today and the New World. Apologies, I know I'm missing some uh, information, uh, both during this time period, as well as more recent work that's come out from this group and their great work. But the first thing we notice is that there's zero published studies on Spilagale eucatenensis, so we know literally nothing about it in terms of some of these major categories. Well, the second least understood or known is no surprise by the Gale and Gustafrons with a total of six published papers. But other groups are missing interesting components, such as diet missing for several of the, um, uh, the species, Leucoparia and Pretorius, or others like lack of spatial ecology uh, papers for Leucoparia, for example, in its true range. Uh, this distribution of, uh, is also geographically biased in terms of the studies as indicated here with the number of studies zero and white up to between 11 and 17 in the darker colors with the majority of the work being done in uh, California and the Western US and Texas and the Eastern United States. But there are areas where there's a you know, clear geographic gap in our understanding, so it's Central America, the inner mountain, mountain, inner mountain west. And then there's also questions I would say about the, the species range or limits in certain areas, such as in Louisiana, where the single specimen we had from Louisiana, which happened to be east of the Mississippi River, was a true a Spilagale pitorius or Alleghenian spotted skunk. But we have nothing from due west of the Mississippi River to see if that's actually truly uh, interrupted, which is what I would hypothesize. Also, a lack of information along the Gulf Coast of Mexico and in the southern part of the Yucatan Peninsula, because our Yucatanensis specimens were restricted to the northern part of the peninsula. So one of the last things I just wanna talk about is, is delayed implantation. And this is just a, a rough summary of what we know about delayed implantation. And it clearly indicates that there are several taxa for which further physiological reproductive investigations would be warranted to, to try to look at and trace the ancestral state or evolution of delayed implantation across this group. And quickly, without uh, diminishing the contributions, I just want to acknowledge that this study would not have been possible without natural history museums and hundreds of collectors over hundreds of years accumulating this material and colleagues as well being willing to share the information and samples. So thank you to them. And with that, I would happily take any questions.